welcome to the T2 Hubcast with me, Tracy Roberts, and today I am joined by a very special guest, and he's going to introduce himself to you right now. Morning, Tracy. Morning. Glad to be here. Uh, so I am Paul Mars. I am a R&D operations director for Reckit. Uh, not many people know Reckit, but we are the people that make things like Lemsip, Neurofen, Gaviscon, Dettol, Airwick, pretty much anything you would find in your medicine drawer or in your cleaning cupboard. So... And you are based in Hull. Yes, and a lot of I people don't realise that, do they? No, we have uh, our uh, scientific centre of excellence based in Hull. Um, it opened just before COVID, actually. Historically, we've always been based in Hull, so Reckitt were actually formed in Hull um, over 100 years ago now. Wow. Um, on the same site that we are today. Um, and then, yeah, just before COVID, we opened a huge brand new science and innovation center where we host most of our um, healthcare, self-care, um, and some home care R&D facilities. It's pretty impressive. Uh, yes. I came to visit a um, couple of months ago for the first time um, when I was coming into prep for a session. I got a little bit of a tour around um, and it's, it's really impressive. It's really cool that you can see through the windows to see what's going on in the labs at certain points. Um, but also what I liked was all the memorabilia on the walls of all the old kind of branding of, like you say, well-known products that people might connect with, rather, yep. like, like Lemsip. In fact, we had a whole Lemsip debate in the office on Monday because <laughs> we had so many people with calls. Um, so it's really cool to be able to work with you guys. Um, obviously, I've worked with yourself and the teams that you've been in um, for the last couple of years. I've also worked with a couple of different teams recently. Um, and I've always just been impressed with the amount of innovation that goes on. But I don't think many people would realize the amount of work that goes into create such amazing products and put them out globally. Um, and one sort of project that I was involved in recently really gave me an insight into that as to, you know, for one change, what kind of domino effect it causes in that yeah. organization. And uh, what's the best thing about working there? Because there's so many different things going on all the time. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't know whether there's one best, one best thing. Um, and it sounds really cliched to say like no two days are the same, yeah. but genuinely it's like that. I mean, I've been there nearly 20 years now. So wow. I joined as a, a year in industry student partway through my degree. I came back straight after I'd finished my master's and had intended to do six months on a temporary contract. And then I was going to go back up to Newcastle where mm -hmm. my, my parents lived. And um, 20 years later, I'm still there. So I think the people, the sort of, the, the variety, the the interest, like you say, you know, you don't really realize what goes into these products. I mean, I started my career off in uh, Airwick, so making air okay. fresheners. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and you don't, you know, you don't realize that, you know, all the, all the products have to be tested to make sure they're not only safe, but they're consumer preferred, that they're mm -hmm. efficacious, that they meet the regulations, that they behave the way you expect them to behave. And mm -hmm. then you, you know, you start adding in things like aerosols, which are obviously potentially dangerous if not managed in the right way. So, you know, there's, there's a huge swathe of, as you alluded to, there's a huge swathe of work that sits behind just getting the product to shelf. And it's, it's incredibly interesting. And then ultimately, you know, 12 months down the line, once you've been working on something, you can go and see it on the shelf in, mm -hmm. your, you know, your supermarket, which is, uh, quite quite fulfilling especially as you know as you start out in your career and you're like oh you know i helped put that on the show yeah. so um and yeah i still have that and now you know my my role has evolved you know i'm a leader of people now and very much for me i guess the thing that keeps me going is is the team the people you know it's a great um cross-functional team a great multinational team and um yeah no two days are the same but it's quite interesting yeah yeah, and having an experience of working with your team, it's the people are definitely something that stand out to me. Um, and it must be they must be doing something right in records to keep you there for twenty years. That's what I think. So it would be really good if we could kind of get into grips with what it is, you know, during our chat today that kind of keeps connecting you with the organisation. But um, today we're going to talk about something that's close to both our hearts. Actually, mm -hmm. it's the value of health and well being, and um, particularly when it comes to working in high pressure roles. Um, and for me, I was just sort of thinking about 20 years ago when you started, you probably wouldn't have had any kind of concept of where you'd end up, but <laughs> you've ended up where you are quite well for yourself, I think, but you really, um, and you know, as things have evolved, I'm imagining that you've kind of had to change your role. How many times did you think 
Oh. Oh, Toby had you have to change your role at Ricketts. I don't know, maybe eight, nine, something. Like okay. That. No. So you've been get you've been able to still get your teeth into certain roles, whereas in some organisations it's so agile with changes to the business that sometimes it's like you know you'll do eighteen months, two years, and then there'll be a different project or a different type of role. So at least I guess you've been able to get your teeth into things and own it. So yeah, to speak. yeah. I mean, I guess as an organisation in general, we are quite we pride ourselves on our agility and pace. So yeah. we are classed as a sort of. Um, fmcg company i know we did we do otc healthcare now mm -hmm. um and when the business acquired the otc business the the view was all of the vast majority of the otc business vast majority was also to try and bring some of that pace and agility into otc so that consumer focus that real innovation which is different from sort of um sort of real died in the wool farmer, you know, 20 year projects and that sort of mm. thing. So everything tends to be on a, a sort of one to three year horizon in general. Mm. Now, obviously that's product withstanding, you know, if things have to go for clinical testing or whatever it may be, then it will take a bit longer to get those out the door. But subsequently, to, coming back to your point, that means that even in, you know, a two to three year tenure in a row, you can usually see things from, from start to finish. Um, that's good. Yeah. So you do get that ability to deliver. I guess, you know, I'm a scientist by trade. Mm -hmm. So there is also that merit in building your scientific depth and, and, you know, credentials in terms of understanding the scientific process, understanding what it takes to make a safe and efficacious product. Yeah. Um, that is also preferred by consumers. You know, like mm -hmm. I said, a big element of what we do is that consumer test and making sure, you know, mm -hmm. that flavors are right that the speed of actions right that the claim set and all of that sort of thing is right i don't think many people out there will think of all those things you know when they look at a product so it's really interesting to me to be able to find all this stuff out as yeah. i've been kind of um diving sort of more into the project stuff behind the scenes so i guess it's good to be able to see things through and it's it's working at a pace which is still challenging you and obviously you're getting innovation in the business but you can still feel that you can own something and see it through so that's great a lot of people, when I talk to them in organizations, they're either stagnant for a long time and that's frustrating or it moves so fast that they can't see things through. Yeah. Of course, that has its own problems as well. So linking it back to, of course, where you are now, if you had to summarize your role to someone who doesn't really understand what you do, how would you? Uh, so we look after products once they've launched. So there's a huge swathe of work that needs to go into sort of... Um, stewardship and custodianship of products once they've launched so there's there's the innovation teams which will build the new products will come up with the concepts the claims develop the formulations do all of the testing that's required to get us through the necessary regulations legislations build the dossiers all that sort of thing mm -hmm. then post launch they get handed over to our team uh, and our team basically ensure that we can keep buying people can keep buying our products okay. so um, the legislative environment changes all the time. Of course. The supply environment changes all the time. So we work quite closely with our supply colleagues in terms of qualifying new materials, helping with equipment and factory changes, um, because all of that still needs capturing, writing up, and then submitting back to regulatory authorities. So if you, I'm going to take something basic like a, a strepsil, a throat sweet, um, if you wanted to make a uh, change to the supplier of one of the raw materials because maybe they've shut their factory and we have to go and get so okay. all of that stuff needs to be tested and qualified to ensure that we are meeting the legislative requirements but our own quality requirements and then that needs all compiling, stability testing. You know, sometimes it can be a week two weeks, three weeks, six weeks, 12 months. It, you know, it depends on the type of change that we make. Um, and then sometimes it has consumer impacts as well. Um, and all of those sort of things are what my team look after. That's a lot. It is, it is. And we <laughs> so do got it, a lot of responsibility. We do it globally as well. So, um, you know, much like in the UK, there's a huge presence for Reckitt. Globally, we have a huge presence as well. Um, different markets have sort of different standout products, but we... Mm. do that job basically across the globe mm. all based out of Hull. although we have people co-located in, in mm. the actual countries um but yes it's all led out of Hull. 
So there's a whole heap of responsibility. Just listen to all those things you said there, you know, for the to the consumer, to the organization. And then also throw it into the mix there for you, people. Yeah. Um, I think the first question I was like to ask someone in a leadership role is, did you want to be a people leader or not? <laughs> um, Sometimes it happens by default. So it's it's so, good to reflect on it. I don't think so. I never set out like even as a as a child, I was never, you know, hell bent on being the leader of a group or anything like that. I went through my early career with the usual sort of excitement that anybody does coming into such an organization. And then, you know, I'll openly admit, I sort of got a bit disillusioned at some point. And it was primarily due to um, the sort of expectation and the gap of the expectation that was in the organization from the the more junior levels to be able to progress. Mm. And I had this moment with myself and I thought, I can leave and I, I thought about it quite hard and I, you know, I had a sort of an alternate career option lined up, um, which was completely different to, to, uh, science, which I've intended on becoming a tattoo artist. Okay. Um, and then I thought, well, you don't get paid very well in the early days. And, you know, I, I had a good, I still had a good job. I was mm. finding fulfillment in what I was doing, but I had this sort of niggle inside that we could be better for our people. And you know, this is, this is sort of 12, 12, 13 years ago now. Um, and I decided that what was the point of taking my toys home? If I could see these things, well, why didn't I stay and try and make a difference? So I sort of made a bit of a commitment to myself that look, I know what I'm doing from a a technical and delivery point of view. I'm quite good at that. Mm. Um, what happens if I start investing that sort of energy? into people development and people leadership um so went off down that path i then quite sort of fortuitously took a a a true leadership role i got offered a leadership role um had to create a team of sort of 15 people um and yeah sort of fell in love with the process of leading and managing people Mm -hmm. um but no I, i certainly never set out with this intention to be a leader or be in charge of people that, you know, I'm, I don't really like the hierarchy and titles that come with yes. it. Um, I know it's a necessity, but I find so much satisfaction in just helping people navigate their careers themselves. Yeah. yeah do what they want to do, be better at whatever it is that they want to be better at. That's certainly a good reason to be in leadership. And it's, it's like you chose the path as well. Whereas a lot of people, I guess that's why I always ask the question. Some people fall into it because, um, you know, of their ability to make decisions and move things forward, but they don't necessarily have the skills or the want to kind of manage other humans because it's quite difficult at times, as yeah. you know. And um, for other people, you know, they'll kind of realize their superpowers at a certain point and actually use it for good. And it sounds like that's something that you've done. So, I mean, I guess really just sort of like heading back towards the subject we're going to mm. uh, there's a lot of pressure on you um in both fronts so you've got obviously the whole kind of organizational requirements from you you've got a team of people that are kind of placed globally as well um a whole team of people that are very different yeah um i'm sure there's been um times where it's been tough um to try and you know whether it's just through general day-to-day management of people or change management or whatever that might be, because that can be the biggest frustration. And then you chuck cultural differences and time zones in there and it gets really messy, right? So you've got a whole heap of pressure in, in your role there. Um, and I guess we're kind of heading more towards, you know, being in a position of where you've got a high pressure responsibility. The conversation we were going to have today was um, the value of actually looking after your health and well-being. Yeah. So is there a reason before we kind of dive into this subject that you kind of really connect with that, you know, that, message if you like why is it so important to you in the role that you do to put that focus back on your health and well-being uh i think a couple of things so i've always been interested in in sport from uh, growing up Mm. not to say that i'm naturally athletically gifted yes i was a, a chubby little kid um but fell into martial arts when i was sort of seven year old okay um played rugby school to to a fairly high standard um continued that march that's i was always and i grew up in newcastle as well and um you know if anybody knows every in newcastle it's all football yeah so mm-hmm. yeah following the football 
In fact, someone stopped me the other day and said, oh, your team are playing Manchester United today. And I was like, are they? So, <laughs> You're um, a football fan. <laughs> so, yeah, well, I just don't, I just don't get it, yeah? Okay. I, I, don't, I don't understand it. So I always did something quite different from a sort of physical point of view mm-hmm. growing up. Um, and continued that through into work and then went to university, uh, sorry, continued that through into university where I sort of really got interested in like weightlifting and bodybuilding, still doing martial arts and then I've sort of continued that all the way through. Mm-hmm. Um, but why, why is that important to me? I think also as well, you know, I grew up um, in a, in a council estate in Newcastle and, you know, fairly standard, normal upbringing. Um, and you know, as I as I got older, I realized that sort of, you know, the, the lifestyles of people around me weren't necessarily the, the healthiest. Mm-hmm. And, you know, certainly, you know, personal story was uh, my father, you know, he had COPD, I think. I joke that he smoked professionally. Um, and, you know, sadly, it's it's not good for your, for your health long term. And, you know, sadly, he's no longer here. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think a lot of that, you know, can be offset by just making sensible choices. And then why does it link to high performing roles? Um, going back to that, that sort of inflection point I talked about where I decided that, you know, leadership's where I want to be. Yeah. Um, I'd reached out to, I was, I was training in the gym and I'd reached out to, um, to just a local gym because it looked like they were doing something different. It was just as these boot camp type things were springing up. And I thought, oh, I quite fancy having a go at that. Mm. And, you know, I turned up, you know, only ever really sort of training martial arts or doing bodybuilding. Remember doing this first boot camp session and literally thought I was going to die. <laughs> I could, you know, I could taste blood. Uh, I was like, is this normal? I could see stars. Brilliant. Um, so that was, that was about 10 years ago now. It was just mm. as I was turning 30. Um, it's a different type of fitness, isn't yeah, it? By the way, I was the one inflicting that pain on most people, so uh, <laughs> I was always at the other side of that. But I do completely connect with that. And I remember, and like, I'd, I'd always, like I said, I'd done martial arts, I played rugby, so I'd always done stuff that was hard. And for me, it was always just about like how far I could push it, like mm-hmm. how far I yeah. could go myself. So I did this boot camp session, and I was, I'm still friends <laughs> with the guys that, that set it up. And they always said, they're like, we never thought you'd come back, you know, because I was like beetroot red, sweating profusely, <laughs> wheezing on the floor. Um, but I did, and I, you know, sort of continued and really from then. So again, that inflection point of, you know, leadership's really important. I also decided that, look, if I need to be resilient and healthy enough to do whatever this these roles may be then probably i should also start looking at my my mm-hmm. personal health and you know how and where those crossovers can be and that's kind of been the journey i've been on for the past sort of 10 or so years mm-hmm. you know understanding and learning the human psychology elements of leadership but then also understanding and learning you know nutrition personal training all of those things yes. that make up the the gamut of the holistic human. And you can connect. Um, you know, this is something else that I feel very passionate about because of my background, but you can definitely connect, the di- you know, the difference than how you feel between when you eat right, when you exercise, when you look after yourself and when you go through a period where that's not the case. Do you notice an immediate difference in how you feel and your mindset as well? Or is it quite physical for you? Uh, no, you, I, I, both, yeah. Yeah. Um, and someone once said to me, yeah, it's got the same guys that ran this, this book camp, but they said to me, um, you don't put potatoes in a Ferrari. Now, look, potatoes are delicious and we all need carbohydrates to live. So um, I'm not saying that- <laughs> We're not vilifying I'm chips not vil- I'm not vilifying <laughs> potatoes, you know, but it was that, like that really brought something home to me was like, actually there's an element of having the right fuel and having the right mm-hmm. sort of- um, you know, service and maintenance, tuning up yeah. to be able to perform at your best. Now, that's not to say that, you know, you can't go and have a few drinks on a weekend, you can't have a McDonald's, like, there's, yeah. there's a balance, yeah? But of course. for me, certainly, um, I try and eat well, I would say 80% of the time, really? you know, and that's even on a daily basis, like, yeah, 80% of what I eat, fruit, vegetables, meat, rice, potatoes, um, and then 20% is like, you know, grab a brownie at mm. the afternoon slump or whatever. Mm. But I do certainly notice if, you know, you've had a 
wild Saturday night and you've stayed up at one o'clock and had a few, until 10 o'clock if yeah, you mean. <laughs> wow a few too many beers then or, or glasses of red wine or whatever your tipple is then you know come come Monday morning you'll still feel that sluggish and yeah you're not quite you're not quite firing on all cylinders and the one thing for me as well obviously with having a global team I do quite a lot of traveling um so international flights I mean there's nothing better than you know being sat on a plate with a glass of red wine but there's also that balance of you know you're turning up somewhere where you are in a completely different time zone and you've just set yourself up for that by getting blind drunk and eating chips for the past 10 hours true so yeah I think there's a lot to be said for just you know managing your fueling managing your um, energy levels and then you know getting there making sure you exercise stretching out just getting a bit of mobility you've been sat you know, crunched up for 10 hours or whatever it may be on an international flight. But there's, for me, there's a definite clues in performance in the workplace mm. coming from just being tuned up and fueled properly mm. physically. I think, you know, the, the mind-body connection is, is critical. And yeah. if one part of the system isn't working, then how do you expect the other part to work? Yeah, because it is like a domino effect, isn't it? You know, one thing can knock... I mean, I always joke with people around the first thing they say to me when they're under a lot of pressure and stress is that sleep suffers. And if you think the difference is sleep makes, you know, if you don't get any sleep the next day, and I think just take that as one indication of what's going on with the rest of your body, you know. So I would like increased cognitive function for me. Um, if I haven't exercised as much or I haven't had as much sleep, I can definitely feel that I'm not as sharp uh, these guys in here definitely know when I trained in the morning and when I haven't. Um, emotional well-being I've put down because I think you're right. The mind-body connection is really important. I think it even affects your decision making and 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 those sorts of things. And then I just think like you're less likely to burn out when you're more likely to be productive if you get all those things in check. And I think you're absolutely right. We can definitely. I think it's an age thing as well. I'm going to be honest. I think as you get older, you, you do tend to like say have two glasses of wine, able to be a hangover from it. But I think there's definitely a connection. But some of the things that people say to me, you know, so if I'm doing any work with any teams or any sort of um, executive coaching clients, they'll sort of say, look, I'd really love to be able to kind of spoon in some of this well-being stuff um, because it's not really a conscious part of their life. And I think that's maybe what you're getting at. For me, it's like a conscious part of my yeah. life. It's diaried into my life as important as all the other stuff. But to get there, there's a journey, isn't there? There's being realistic about obviously what you're going to achieve living the 80 20 rule which is definitely yeah. what i agree with as well is finding stuff you enjoy because if you if you if you focus on things that you think that'll be a quick fix there and i don't enjoy it it won't be it won't work in the long term and there's also that balance between um you know are you good like let's think about a christmas diet everyone wants to get in their little black dress so a couple of weeks before they all go crazy and go to boot camp for six weeks to look good in the christmas and then they just put it all back on after christmas and then they feel yeah. awful in january and if we can just have that steady flow that we can just enjoy christmas can't yeah. we but Lack of time, people say to me all the time, I don't have time. Um, I've got too much work, so I put all my priorities on getting this work finished. And then the thing that comes last is the gym or eating or whatever it might be. Um, fear of falling behind is the thing that comes up. You know, if I take my lunch break to go for exercise or I don't get in before everyone else in the morning and instead of going to the gym, then the reality is I'm going to feel like I'm on the back foot all day. Um prioritizing short-term goals, like I said, maybe think of like, you know, your, the summer, the summer body. Uh, workouts that we've got and um, the other thing I wrote down was perceived weakness some people think if I actually like put my hand up in the workplace and go um do you know what I just need a breather <laughs> I just need to take my lunch time actually because yeah. for some people they'll maybe think right the only place I can get a bit of exercise or activity in is lunchtime I'll go for a walk or I'll go to the gym but for other people just taking a lunch break is wellness yep go in and take some time to breathe and eat some decent food and actually think about what you're eating. Yep. That's a big thing that I found over the years is that connection between um, understanding what you're eating, tasting it, yep. <laughs> actually appreciating it rather than shoving it down your throat in in um, you know s such a quick time. Um, the other thing that I wrote down there was lack of awareness. I think that people who maybe don't make wellness part of their kind of day-to-day -day kind of traits and things that they put in their diary is... It, it's too late when they feel the lack of wellness. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. So for some people, it's like acute stress hits them very hard and then they don't kind of make the links with the fact that actually that's been a spiral that's been coming for a long period of time. Um, 
I find just one small thing and I can just, I just feel slightly out of balance a little bit. So for me, I like to just think, right, what's missing? I need to plug the jigsaw piece back in. Are you similar? Do you think you can feel a small change creeping in? And- <clears throat> yes and no. So I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty um, disciplined as it comes to my sort of health and fitness. That's not to say that it's like, you know, hell bent, I've got to do this, got to do the other. Yeah. Um, the biggest one for me is sleep. I love bed. Like, I love, <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> I love going to sleep. Um, I always try for eight hours a night. So, um, you know, people are like, well, how do you get so much sleep? And like, well, just don't sit and watch. Shadow Rubbish telly. Yeah, until 1 a.m. So mm. I think you do have to sort of have a bit of a bit of discipline with yourself, knowing that actually it's a bit like brushing your teeth. Yeah, you brush your teeth once on a morning and you don't see any wild benefit. But you know, 20 years down the line, you've still got all your teeth. Mm. So I think it's that, you know, small, consistent things that you can do over time that all add up Mm -hmm. to to make you feel as a whole. But I don't necessarily notice the one thing that's missing because the thing that tends to happen to me is everything gets so wild, usually when I'm traveling, you know. Yeah. And and a couple of of months ago, I was in um, China and we, we literally landed in Shanghai Weighed in passport control, ran through the airport to get another plane to um, another city in China. Marvel. Got on that plane, landed at midnight. You know, got picked up at seven a.m. the following morning. So we're in a hotel for you know not but six hours. Of course, we're getting picked up so early. We hadn't had breakfast. You know, you then get into the office and they put on cakes and muffins for you and loads of coffee, and you think, okay, that's great. And you know, you're fueled on sugar and caffeine until. 12 o'clock and then they bring in pizza because they don't let you eat the food that comes from the region because mm. you know that you're western and you want western food which is not always <laughs> the case but you'd probably be extremely happy yeah, that, wouldn't you? Just yeah. some vegetables would have been nice so yeah. you know and then we had that day in the office we got back on in the car got back to the airport and flew back to shanghai ready for another day in shanghai on the on the wednesday and um you know by that sort of thursday it, but the team were like, oh, we're going to go out for dinner. And I was like, I will literally die if I have to go out for dinner. <laughs> yeah, so, I've been there. Yeah, because you yeah. go on out, you know, and you, have, you, you know, you have to sort of pack and you don't have to. But it's, you know, it's part of the, the custom to have a glass of red wine and dinner. You stay up till oh. 11 o'clock, you know. So sleep was getting curtailed. Quality nutrition was getting curtailed. Now, it's mm. not to say that I wasn't fueled because I had probably more than enough calories in me. But, you know. You know, I hadn't seen a piece, quality of the yeah, I hadn't yeah. seen a piece of broccoli or a piece of fruit in three days. So that's when I can start feeling it mm. um, more so than just sort of one thing out of kill that for me. And it's a little bit all or nothing. Like I'm either like super on it or some big sort of intervention happens and I end <laughs> up in a state where I haven't, you know, I've had four hours sleep in three days and mm. drank two bottles of red wine just because mm. of. Sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it seems great at the time. And then, you know, you you um you do the reckoning of the the sort of debits by the time you get back and you realize that it wasn't great. You know, and just to give you the that example, so I was traveling for two whole weeks. I was China and then India. And um again, you know, not silly nights out, not long drinking or anything like that, but my Rest and heart rate had gone from 58 when I left to 72 when I came back. So you can see that even the just the impact on the autonomics that it has. Yeah. You know, being on a different time zone has that pressure anyway. Yes, of course. Lack of sleep has that pressure. Lack of adequate nutrition. Lack of, of course, lack of training. So you're not, I'm not, I wasn't exercising because you go to bed really late. You're getting up really early. Now, to your point about can you find time? You can always find time. But then for me... I sleep is a more always right? prioritize sleep. Yeah. Like so, sleep is my f- first priority, closely followed by what I'm consuming yeah. and then my training. Yeah. So if I can get my sleep and my nutrition okay, then I can you can keep it. The, yeah. Live ship a few sailing. days without the training. Yeah. Um, but for me, exercising is fun, so I enjoy it. It's like yeah. you know where I go and get mindful. It's where I get to yeah. peace. So. Um, is it one thing? No, for me, it's making sure that all those little things are in place, but realizing as well what well, you can and can't give up. Yeah, and I think maybe that's one thing I'm going to land on today is like there's a priority system for most humans and 
for some people, it's, you know, sleep is the most important yeah. thing for others. It's food. So we'll look at that. But you, you kind of alluded to a couple of the side effects that people can start to think about. If they start to feel stress and anxiety quicker than normal, um, more, more acutely than normal, should we say, or if they know there's someone who lets stress build up over a short period of time and then it kind of amasses really quickly, then I think that can be an indication that maybe the sleep, the food, the movement, I would say movement, not exercise, because yeah. not everybody exercises, it, you know, could be a little piece of the jigsaw that's missing for someone, you know, um, if you've got sleep disturbance going on, sometimes the stress of work starts to creep in, doesn't it? And then yep. even when you want to sleep, you can't sleep. Sometimes stripping that back and looking at food can help with that as well. Um, like you said, the, the aches and pains that you get as well. Like for me, the biggest thing is when I'm traveling in the car or I've been on an airplane for a long time, it's when I get off, I feel like I've been constricted. Yep. And I'm half the size of normal. So for me, it's more about mobility than anything else. So it's important for people to start maybe thinking about the connection that they have between, you know, are they someone that lets this kind of stress build up or are they someone that feels it very quickly? Is there something that they can do to get themselves back in check in some shape or form, whether or not it is sleep, whether or not it is food? The food thing is always an interesting one for me because when I have that conversation with people, they will say things like, I don't have time to meal prep or I don't have time um, to think about what I'm eating, I have to grab something. And I think I kind of see where people are going with that because it can be tricky, particularly when you're traveling yeah. or like even culturally, you know, if you go somewhere and that's what you're given, it's rude for you to say, I don't want to eat that or that's not that's not what I'm into. Um, the alcohol thing is always an interesting one for me because people do expect you to have a drink sometimes. And I think it's wrong that people expect that, okay. but it's interesting to see people's perceptions of that as well. Um, but going back to the to the point I was trying to land on, it's, it's more around people's priorities, what they think their boundaries are. And of course, going back to the eating part, what can they do to minimize the damage? Mm. So 80-20 is a really good way to look at it. I've always kind of lived by that. It's okay um, I'm just going to be mindful of what I'm eating. That's the word I use. But if I want to have brownie in the afternoon or if I want to do something, that's totally fine. Um, I also get people saying it's easier to uh, eat well at home if they're working from home because we've got obviously hybrid working. And I actually get people saying it's harder. So I have people that say, well, actually, because I can buy everything in that I need to eat and I can nip down to the kitchen to eat what I want, that's great. Other people say, no, my kitchen is too close. <laughs> Yeah. And I will literally go and eat all the wrong stuff if I've just had a bad meeting. Um, my advice normally is, is to like just prep like you were leaving the house sometimes. But um, do you find it easier if you're working from home or are you quite disciplined in terms of? Uh, I find it easier if I'm working from home just exactly to that point. I, you know, I have fruit and vegetables and whatever else mm. in the fridge. But also, you know, and I, I look to, to COVID um you know when we were properly at home all the time i lost not intentionally you know i lost kilos mm. because i was so busy and then to your point the convenience i ended up living on sort of like breakfast biscuits and coffee because mm. i was busy with work and i was at home and it was new and i was you know so sort of just thinking oh, i'll just grab something because i need to be back at my yeah my kitchen table to take another call and mm. you know that um i, th I think there's both elements playing, yeah. but then it just comes down to discipline and yeah. sort of, again, it goes back to brushing your teeth. Like, would you not brush your teeth twice a day? No, you know, make sure. Maybe it's a wreck of a hole. Yeah. <laughs> sure Nobody's going to be bothered about it then. Make but, sure yeah. you eat some fruits and vegetables and, you know, some meats and getting some balance mm. um, or some protein. It doesn't have to be yeah, meat if you're not into meat. But um, yeah, I, I don't. I, I probably find it easier working from home just because the stuff's there, but also at home, I'm also more tempted not to take the bricks. You know, I'll just yeah. run into the kitchen, grab something, run back to back to my desk. So um, that's definitely how I was during COVID. I think pretty similar. I actually worked longer hours, and because you didn't have those breaks of. Um, you know, maybe having a chat with someone at the next yep. desk or, you know, nip into the canteen or whatever it is. You just sit there yeah. um, glued and team's call after team's call after team's call was just madness, to be honest. So I think it's good for people to be able to consider, you know, depending on what kind of role they have as a hybrid or working at home, what's going to make it easier. One of the things I've put down here is just mindful eating and making sure that you've set yourself up for success. 
So ultimately, it's like they say, isn't it? Um, if you go to the supermarket hungry, you're going to buy the entire yeah. contents of aisle seven that you shouldn't. Um, if you go when you're in a good place, you'll fill it full of stuff, um, your basketball stuff that's actually going to be good. And then when you do open the fridge or the cupboard to get something, there's you will be annoyed sometimes, by the way, when you realize you haven't bought any chocolate hobnobs, but that's completely good because you've, you've thought it through. Um, but yeah, I think maybe making sure that that's part of the, I don't know, the contract you have with yourself about what you're going to put into your system. The other thing that I used to do with clients, which I found really useful, was if people couldn't necessarily make the connection between how they felt after eating certain foods and how they felt after eating, you know, something different, was I used to get people just to, just for a week, um, after the eating, you know, a couple of hours after whatever, it's just maybe write down how they're feeling sometimes yeah. because people will go for that quick hit, like you say, that sandwich. And then we always talk about the mid-afternoon slump and stuff, don't we? But actually, if they start to change it up a little and what they ate and take, you know, taking the brownie out of the equation and put something else in, all those things, I think people can start to make that connection between actually their energy distribution cycle and how they can be more effective. Um, it sounds really boring and who wants to give up chocolate brownies, but I think you can make a connection between how you feel after you've eaten and actually how psyched up you are. So if you're someone who's going to go to the gym at night, how do you make sure that you're not getting to the gym exhausted and yeah. really having to force yourself? But everyone's different. Like I'm an early morning person. I'm out of my bed, straight to the gym, don't even pass go talk to anyone. Other people say it's their worst nightmare. They have to get through the day to then go and do some exercise. So I think scheduling it in at a time that just feels good for you is important. Um, I would really struggle to train after work because my mind is like blown. Are you are you specific about that or are you um take I, it take it or leave it basically? My preference is to train after work. Mm -hmm. Um usually because I do quite a bit of heavy lifting, I like just to be mobile and fueled. Yeah. Um but then also I you know, I train I train my martial arts after work as well. And mm -hmm. you know, they don't have a six AM class. Well, they, <laughs> I say that they do, and this this comes about this choice thing. So there is like a six and a seven AM class, but I, I I physically you. can't fit it in to then get showered and changed and back, you know, through the traffic, back in. Ready to work, for it, yeah. Ready for, for my day. I mean, if I had the, you know, if I wasn't working, I'd probably be there twice a day. <laughs> I'd be there morning and night. But my preference is to train mm. um, after the day's work. And, and again, like I say, for me, it's that mindfulness. It's It allows me to wash out the day. Mm. You know, I go and train and the thing I'm focused on is the training. Mm. Um and I think having that, you know, f for me at least, having that portion doing something hard that focuses your mind. Because mm. sometimes you go to the gym and you just have those like flappy sessions. Go through the motions. You go through the motions. Yeah. But when you can go and put one of those sort of hard sessions in where literally the only thing you think about is what you're doing, mm. then I think that's actually quite beneficial just from washing the day out. Mm. It also, for me, and this, this goes back to the point that you were making about um, time boundaries, for me, it gives me a very clear cutoff. So if I've okay. got to make yeah. a, if I've got to make a six forty-five jujitsu class, then I know that I can't be sat in that office any longer than six o'clock. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's a non-negotiable then. It's a non-negotiable for me because it's like, well, I know I need to go and train. You know, I've paid my money. People are expecting me, my you know, teammates are expecting me to go up, a trip, show up, and train with them. Mm. So if I'm sat here sending emails, then I'm not really yeah. contributing to that. Now, a lot of people ask me at work, obviously I have a, quite a, a busy job, and a lot of people ask me, like, well, how, how do you make that time? And I kind of glibly just say, well, I just shut my laptop. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and people sort of look really confused. <laughs> it's, it's a choice. It's an alien concept. <laughs> yeah, it's a choice for me. Like, you know, I wouldn't propose that you finish at three o'clock every day to go and, put two hours in the gym because you know you're not doing what you need to do for your oh. for your work but also you know two three times a week you're like right this is my goal of course it is, and then yeah. it then it becomes about how do you be more efficient in what you're doing through the day mm. you know are you dedicating time on stuff that doesn't need time dedicating to or are you taking too long to do certain mm. things is the better ways to do things um mm. and ultimately as well i always say it's a bit like shoveling snow while it's still snowing mm. so you could sit and work till midnight and you go to bed. And what happens when you get up at 8 a.m.? Mm. You open your emails. Oh, there's more emails. There's more work to do. Yeah. yeah. Now, providing you've hit your urgent and important stuff and, and anything that's time-bound is done on a time-bound basis, then 
just work out when the rest of the stuff needs to fall such that mm. you can give yourself enough time to go and exercise, to eat properly. Yeah. Um, because it's, you know, and I've, I've fell in that trap, you know, years and years and years ago. I used to work till like midnight. And you'd end up working till midnight and then you get up tired and it takes you to like 10, 11 a.m. to like get into your stride in the office. Yeah. Coffees and some, you know, sugar to get you going. And then you feel rubbish by about three o'clock because you've not properly fueled. Yeah. And then you think, oh, I'll just put that off till tonight because I know I'll have to work tonight because I'm quite behind. And you end up just shifting your day do, from yeah. like this sort of, you know, eight till five or eight till six, whatever it is, to sort of nine, 10, 11 till midnight. And mm. then you're sacrificing your sleep, you're sacrificing your ability to, to go to the gym or to train or to do whatever it is that you yeah. want to do. So I think you've got to be aware of the impact of your working patterns and then subsequently work out well okay when can i train and what are going to be my non-negotiables and like mm -hmm. i said you know twice a week i have a jujitsu class and that is right i'm sure stop yeah going yeah um that's a good thing though and i think people will have to just establish what's important to them won't mm -hmm. they and but going back to the, the word i was going to use here was like building resilience because resilience uh, and I'm just going to remind everyone, because obviously we talk about this a lot, the ability to return to your baseline emotional and mental state after a successful traumatic or triumphant event. And we talk about this a lot here because we feel that this is the word is quite misunderstood by people. And I think getting all these things right, this, this balance, as you said, right, allows you to understand what your baseline looks like. So when you feel steady in control and you have focus, so you've already outlined if you're working till midnight, you know you're not at your baseline even before you start. Yeah. You're all off. But then you're gonna have traumatic days as a leader and, and you know, someone is a you know high pressure will in the organization, or just take something as simple as you, you start to get a bit of compassion fatigue because there's so much going on with your team and you're taking in all their issues and there's all those things going on. Of course, that's gonna uh, affect your ability to bounce back to your, you know, your sort of like relaxed state, if you like. So it's worthwhile thinking about that. Boundaries is a big word for me. So I thought what we'd look at is like five things just to end on. And if there's anything that you want to just add to them, then feel free. Can so I just pick up on that resiliency piece? Yes. Is that okay? Because I think there's, there's two things for me in it that, that you know, being mindful of your health and wellness yeah. has with regards to resiliency. One is, I guess, the physiological effects of pressure. So, yes. you know, high heart rate, you know, um, sort of inflammatory processes yes. that are caused by all of that sort of stress. Now, if your system is better tuned, better fueled, adaptable to that through pushing yourself through things like exercise and making sure that, you know, you have enough macronutrients, you have enough micronutrients, yeah. that actually you can absorb those stresses and the, the, the yeah. physiological pressures yeah. that are put on them. The other one is... Um, and this is why I think exercise is quite important. And I say this to everybody is like, do something hard because the hardest thing that you have done is the hardest thing that you've ever done. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to resiliency, pushing that boundary, just yeah, bit. understanding where your true limit is. And now this, yeah, this is maybe starting to get a little bit um, too sort of extreme, but you know, doing a really hard boot camp, running a marathon, and I'm not for a moment suggesting that people need to do this all of the time. Yeah. But at least doing it once and understanding where your physical capabilities mm. lie and not giving in yeah. gives you that resiliency. I mean, I was watching on the TV last night the, that Squid Game. The, yes, yeah. Done the game show of it, and they were doing the running back and forth piece. And one lady stopped in a squat. I don't know why she stopped in the squat. It's probably the worst position to stop it. I was going to say. And she's talking to us and says, oh, this is too difficult. This is, no, I can't do it. The pain's too much. And she literally folded within seconds because- The mindset didn't connect with her physicality. Her mindset didn't yeah. connect with her physicality. So doing something hard physically, yeah, whether it's, you know, even once, just try and run a 5K, a 10K. Put a little bit more weight on. Yeah, you put a little bit more yeah. weight on the bar. Or going, you know, jujitsu, and I don't want to talk, turn this into a sermon about jujitsu, but jujitsu is fantastic for that because, you know, it's live, it's real, it's it's a bit like a fight. And yeah. in that moment, the only thing you can think about is that. But mm. it's entirely down to your ability to keep going. And yeah. Building that physical resiliency gives you the mental resiliency mm. such that when difficult things happen at work, they're not really that difficult. If the most difficult thing that has ever happened to you is 
you've forgotten the pound for your trolley when you go shopping. <laughs> you have an absolute... Hate that. You have, a, you have a meltdown when something goes wrong at work. If the most difficult thing that you've done is, you know, ran a, a marathon and you've, you know, been... And I've never run a marathon. It's a silly idea. Yeah, but I agree with that. As you get into those, you know, those last few miles and it gets really hard, then it's about keeping your mind going. So I think there's, there's a huge benefit in finding your own physical limits and pushing them yourself. Yeah, definitely. To then build that resiliency, just to know that you can do it. And that helps you understand as well, like, why am I not being able to return to my baseline as quickly? Why do I feel slightly off kill? So I think you're absolutely right. And for everybody out there, there is a marginal gain somewhere, of isn't course, there? Of course. So it doesn't is. matter what it is. It can be, you know, walking to work instead of driving. It can be taking the stairs instead of, you know, the, you know, the, the escalators. But for other people, it is about thinking, right, how can I challenge myself this morning? But that connection between how you speak to yourself and actually the physical elements is super important. Really? So what we've established <laughs> is that um, we need to set clear priorities for ourselves. Yep. Um, what's important to you. Yep. And so that links to both things, the health and well-being aspect. So what, like you said, sleep is your non-negotiable and food and exercise is up there. But for other people, sometimes it's just taking regular breaks. Yep. Sometimes it's mindfulness. Sometimes it's actually just, if they're working from home, taking themselves out of their chair and going for a walk. Um, for other people, it's, you know, in their life, are they, as part of their health and wellness, are their family involved yeah. in there? Because that's a big piece for some people. Like, especially if you're a glue to your desk at home, that can be a big problem. You think, great, I've got lots of time to be around my family and be present. It doesn't always happen. So for other people, that might sit within your priorities. So you've got to work out what's important. And I guess that lines up with what you were saying about getting your day started well as well. You know, have you diaried in that time? I, I put my lunch in my diary, I put my exercise on my diary, all those things because... I know it's a bit of a cheesy thing to say, but you wouldn't, you, you know, you wouldn't cancel your meetings yeah. in that sense. Um, creating realistic routines. Yeah. I think we've kind of covered that. So it's like, what can I like stick to um, that I know is not going to be overreaching um, in terms of what I'm trying to aim to achieve for the week. But at the same time, it's a non-negotiable. So if I need to do that thing, I'm going to close my laptop and I'm going to go do those things as well. I remember years and years ago, I had a, a, a coach, a PT, and... Um, He'd given me a diet to follow as part of, you know, as part of the training that we're doing. And it was like two meals per day were like mackerel and broccoli. <laughs> broccoli, yes, mackerel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't mind mackerel, to be fair, but it was like, you know, at 11 o'clock, you must eat your mackerel and broccoli. And then at three o'clock, you must eat your mackerel and broccoli and then lick an almond or something like that. <laughs> oh, they lick it. You can't yeah, eat it. Don't eat it. Just lick it. <laughs> and um I remember saying, like, this is just totally unrealistic. Like, I'm sat in meetings nearly all day. Like, well, you've got to crack up in the door. Yeah, just, oh, well, just take your mackerel in. And I'm like, <laughs> that's ridiculous. So I think my, I wouldn't have that, by the way. We're not like, <laughs> we're not like stinky food in the office. I have to sit out here and eat my eggs in the morning. So, so I think to that point, there is an element of, you know, we're, the, primarily, you know, we're, we're in the field of business or whatever yeah. it may be, and we're looking at being better at that we're not looking to be professional athletes or we're not going to be a bodybuilder on stage so you don't necessarily have to go to those lengths of idiocy I keep it real yeah, yeah mackerel and broccoli five times a day you know regimented because there's also that system that you operate within and like mm. i can't take a thing of mackerel into a meat and that's no. not appropriate but then you know making sure that you've got good choices of food at lunchtime, yes. or like you said, take a break. And so I th I think there's a big element. hundred percent, yeah. Understanding what can work versus what people say you have to do. Yeah. yeah there's, there's, a, there's a balance there. Definitely. Well. I think it goes into my next point, which was setting achievable goals. So that's more around, you know, I, I guess what that health and well-being looks like to you. But also within that, it's, okay, what is achievable for me? So if I am on, on a journey to just eat better, then great, I can eat these many things in a day or I can restrict to this many cut whatever is right for you but you know setting yourself up to lose 14 stone in a day as quoting <laughs> Peter K is not the way to go we've got to think what does that look like and um, because if we set unachievable goals we're more likely to fail but we're also more likely to feel worse about ourselves yeah. in the long term and then the next one I put down was practice self-compassion I think we put too much pressure on ourselves sometimes to be perfect and to do things so so well 
And it's okay to have a bad day. Like you said, that's what the 80 20 is there for. It's okay to, you know, go out with a client and enjoy a three course dinner and a glass of red wine from time to time. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, equally, it's okay to have a day where you just don't feel like training or you, you, you know, you don't feel like um, taking yourself out there uh, in terms of your food prep or whatever it might be. Um, it's okay just to start again tomorrow, you know. Um, and then the, the big thing at the end was, and, and it's around our boundaries, setting our boundaries. For me, I think that's super important. I don't think we do that enough as humans, let alone in the workplace or with our health and well-being. I think we do need to set our priorities out and say, okay, what will I um, you know, accept and what won't I accept? And as a and you shouldn't really have to explain that to people either. You know, I know that sounds harsh, particularly when you're a boss and you've got to go, sorry, but I can't speak to you right now because I've got to go do X, Y, Z. But there are going to have to be times, you know, with, within your professional life and your personal life where those boundaries have to be, you know, discussed and people need to understand that that's what's important to you. Um, and I think if you can kind of focus on those five things and all the things we've discussed today, I think there should be a couple of little tidbits for most people that can start to think about actually, yeah, what can I focus on right now? What are my priorities and my boundaries? Um, P.S. It's okay to have an off day from time to time. Um, but I'd like to think that people are that are sort of operating high pressure rules do put a little bit of emphasis on this health and well-being aspect. Unfortunately, I don't think enough people do. Um, but I do see it as a marginal gain for most people. I totally, totally agree. I think it's definitely a marginal gain. I think going just going back to your point about, you know, being kind to yourself and being easy on yourself, and it's that thing that, you know, people think if you are training and eating well, you've got to do it. 100% every day all the time and you don't yeah no. it's it, it, like you say it's 80 20 I think there's a there's that start Monday mentality mm. which is like well if you start, start Monday, Wednesday it's like start why don't you just start now you know I've had three biscuits I may as well eat the packet it's like well if you've got a flat tire do you go and let the rest of your tires down <laughs> or you just go in and you sort of say okay I've had my phone I've you know I've had my glass of wine I've had my biscuits whatever it may be I'll you know I'll the next choice I make will be a bit better. But I do think there's, there's definite marginal gains to be made from a work performance point of view just by focusing on the real basics. And, it, you know, it doesn't have to be boot camps, it doesn't have to be marathons, but are you getting enough sleep? Are you getting enough water? Are you getting the right foods in? Mm. And are you doing some sort of movement a few times a week? Even, just if, move, you know, yeah. even if it's just a bit of yoga or a bit of mobility, t- as you start to build up to do something mm. that... Because really everybody should do some cardiovascular work, some strength work, just to keep you healthy into your old mm-hmm. age. And you know, we all have parents or family members who aren't in the greatest of health. And you also then see people of a similar age who are running marathons. And that's just cumulative gains of fitness, yeah? So mm-hmm. that's I think a really good point. The first thing for me, though, is sleep helps cognitively, helps you repair, helps you recover. Proper hydration proper nutrition and then some sort of movement and, mm. and physicality and then building up to doing something that does actually push you Absolutely. again and it doesn't have to be at the expense of everything and if you need a week off because you've got too much work on then do it fine do it and then yeah pick up again the next week just don't let all your tires down <laughs> I, I think that's hilarious um it certainly served you well um we really enjoyed having you on the podcast today paul so thanks for joining us Um, And we look forward to seeing you again soon for another T2 webcast.